today we're talking about data's recovery, right? The idea of data's recovery is obviously we're in memory. All our changes are going to be hanging out in memory. And so that way we want to make sure if there's a crash or there's a failure or, you know, someone trips over the power cord that we don't lose any of our data, right? And our, our problem is, is particularly challenging because, we, you know, we're not assuming the database is going to be backed by disk. It's, everything's in memory. So we still want to make sure that everything is going to be durable. So the... The, the recovery algorithms in general, uh, they're going to be used by our database system to provide three out of the four guarantees that we want in an asset database. So consistency, atomicity, and durability. Um, I think I, this should all should be sort of introduction stuff, so we, we don't need to cover it in too much detail. But in general, every recovery algorithm is going to have, be comprised of two parts. The first part is what you're doing while the system is running, while you're executing transactions and updating the database. So all the stuff you're going to do to prepare yourself in case there's a failure. And then after there's a failure, or after there's a restart, it's how do we recover all the database using the data that we were maintaining or the extra information that we were recording while we are running our transactions normally. So for this one, we're, we're, for this one lecture, we're going to focus on how to do, how to do both of these. So the the, if you look at the early papers on in-memory databases going back to the 1980s when these, at, you know, when these things were first being built, um, they made this huge assumption in all their implementations and that they were going to rely on non-volatile memory as the, as the backing store of, of the database, of, you know, of where the database is actually stored. So back then, non-volatile memory was essentially battery backed up DRAM. So that meant that if you lose power to the machine, then there would be a little battery there that would have enough juice to be able to take the contents of DRAM, write it out to some stable storage or non-volatile storage, like you know, back then a spinning disk hard drive, or, or it could be an SSD today. Um, and so all of these early systems assumed, oh yeah, you're gonna have MVM. So they didn't really worry about how to actually implement the logging and, and checkpoint protocols that we'll be talking about today. So what I'll say is that battery backed up DRAM is still an option today. Uh, but you think of like on Amazon, you can't get a machine on Amazon that has battery backed up DRAM. Right? You can go buy it from some vendor and it'll, they'll have it. Uh, but in practice, this is not what people are using on commodity hardware. Um, there's a bunch of other reasons like there, it's quite large because you actually had the battery on the motherboard and that takes up real estate on the motherboard that you could be using for other devices. Um, and it's notoriously finicky about how reliable these things are. Right? Everything's great. If your battery, you assume your battery is fine, and then you actually need it, and the battery is you know, dead or it doesn't have enough juice for you. What I'll say also, too, what we're not, not going to talk about this semester, um, but I'm happy to talk about offline, is that there is a new harbor, class of hardware devices coming out, uh, like now, like this year, uh, called non volatile memory that's actually not battery backed up DRAM, but actually a new storage medium or new storage material that is truly non volatile. Meaning, like, it's going to look like DRAM. It fits, in, fits into the DIMM slot, your motherboard. It's byte addressable. You can read and write to it just like DRAM. But if you pull power, then everything gets retained, like an SSD. So Intel calls this, uh, has a bunch of different marketing names. 3D Crosspoint, I think, is the term they're using. Or Apache Pass is another one, right? Or Opt Optane Memory is the third one. Uh, but again, these are actually, again, it looks like DRAM to you as in your application, but it's actually truly non-volatile. And normally when I give this lecture, I, I keep saying like, oh, it's two years away, two years away, two years away. It's actually now, 2019, of course now, yeah. And I went, went back and watched the lecture from last year, and in 2018, I said, yeah, it's coming in 2019. So hopefully I'll be correct in this time. Like, this is real, like, we actually have access to it at CMU. We have a PCIe device here that, that, that's in our lab. That's not that interesting because that just looks like an SSD, but you can actually get the real hardware uh, from Intel now, but they haven't like publicly made it available. So the, the main thing I'll tell you about this is like this doesn't exist yet, but it's coming, and nobody actually uses this. So the techniques we're going to talk about today are, has to be designed for what's available, what's available to us now, right? Commodity SSDs and spinning disk hard drives. So for in-memory database recovery, our, the problem that, we have to, you know, that we're trying to solve of how do we make sure that our database is durable after a crash is slightly easier than what we would have to do in a disk-oriented system. Um, and this is, this is partly because we don't have a buffer pool anymore, so therefore we don't have to worry about dirty pages getting written out the disk before the log records that correspond to those changes or how those pages got dirty in the first place 
are written out the disk. So this means that we don't have to have log sequence numbers or LSNs. We don't need to do all those compensation log records, all the crap we told you about last class or last semester in, in about Aries in the introduction class. We don't have to do any of that here. So our life is easier. We also need to record less data out on disk than we have to do for a disk oriented database because we only care about redo. We don't care about undo, right? Undo you need if you write dirty pages that, that, that have been modified by a transaction that hasn't committed yet. So you need to know how to un, you know, reverse their changes and go back to the original form, the original state. We don't have any dirty pages. Nothing that's uncommitted will ever get written to disk. So therefore, we don't, need to, we don't need to restore undo after the transaction commits. Now, while the transaction is running, we actually you know, still need to keep undo because the transaction may get aborted and roll back. But once it commits, we know we're never going to reverse any of these changes. So we only need redo. The other important thing about understanding the difference between a disk-oriented database and in-memory database for recovery is that, to the best of my knowledge, no in-memory database actually records the changes that are made to indexes. Now, lean store was slightly different that we saw last, last class, but think of like, thinking like all the major commercial database systems, uh, MemSQL, HANA, AltaBase, VoltDB, none of these systems actually record any modifications you make to indexes in the log. Because right? the idea is that if I crash my system and I come back, I've got to load the database back from disk into memory anyway. So Rather than me you know, bringing back in a bunch of extra stuff about how indexes were modified, I'll just rebuild the index as I bring the data in from the checkpoint. This also makes us easier when we're running, because now we don't have the log changes to, check, or to indexes, and we can run faster normally as well. So again, no, no in-memory database, to the best of my knowledge, will actually log any changes to indexes. We just, we just re rebuild them upon restart. So this all sounds nice. But at the end of the day, we're still dealing with a slow disk, right? That's going to be the main bottleneck we have to overcome, just the same way we had this problem with the larger than memory databases last class. But just again, just because we're an in-memory database does not make our magic, you know, make our four kilobyte uh, page writes out to the disk go any faster. The disk doesn't care whether we're an in-memory database or a disk database. It's going to always go at the same speed of whatever it actually can do. So we're still going to have to deal with, with, that, with that slowness. All right, so for today's agenda, I want to break up into three groups. So the first two parts will be about actually how to do you know, logging and recovery to restore the state of the database correctly after a crash. All right, so we'll talk about logging protocols and do checkpoints. Right? And then as sort of a bonus part at the end, I want to talk about how to do restart protocols. And this is when I am not, the system didn't crash, I just need to restart it. And how can I do that very, very quickly? It sort of looks like the same way of, of restarting up the crash. Um, but there's, you know, for this one, we can assume that we can retain memory from one, from one uh, restart to the next. Whereas in these two other guys, you can't assume that. Because right? a crash you know, you know, could be either the OS crashes, my process crashes, or the machine crashes. So I assume memory is gone. OK? All right. So, the first thing we talk about is how can we do logging? What are, what are the different techniques or approaches we can have to logging? So again, this should not be uh, uh, you know, groundbreaking news for anyone here, especially if you read the Silo R paper. But in general, there's two high-level classes of logging schemes you can have. The first is called physical logging. And this is where we're going to record in the log the low-level changes that transactions make to the individual tuples or the bytes of, of the database, right? And so in the case of the Silo R paper, they call this uh, value logging. The same idea, we, like for every single transaction, they modify a, an attribute in a tuple, and we record the bits that were actually, you know, that, that got written to that new, uh, that new change of the tuple. The alternative approach is called logical logging. And this is where we're going to, instead of recording the low-level bytes or the bits of how the, the, the transaction modified the database, we're actually going to just store the operation that the transaction invoked to cause that change. So you can think of this as like actually just storing the, the raw SQL statement that they invoked to do either insert, update, or delete. Right? So and again, in the case of, of silo R, they called this, I think, operation logging. Right, so, the, so the silo R guys are awesome, but that was not published in a database conference. It was not written by 
database people. So they refer to things as value logging or operation logging, uh, but just convert that into database parlance would be database logging or physical logging and logical logging. We'll see another example where they use different terms for, for things that we describe in, in, a, in a different vernacular. All right, so the obvious advantage of logical logging is that you end up writing less data for, for, for each, lo each, each log record than you normally would in physical logging. So let's say that I have a transaction, it updates a billion tuples. With logical logging, uh, I would just have that single update statement in my log record that, that could update a billion tuples. But under physical logging, I would have to have, for every single one billion tuple that I modified, the actual change that I overwrote into those tuples, right? the actual physical representation of, of the record that, that got modified. So again, this sounds very seductive. This sounds like logical logging is what we would want to use for everything. Uh, the challenge, though, is that if you have concurrent transactions, meaning transactions running at the same time, interleaving their operations, then it's sometimes hard to, diff to, to, to determine the order in which the different transactions modify the tuples in the, in the, in a, you know, in the database, if they're modifying the same tuple. Right, this especially, this especially becomes problematic if you run at a lower isolation level. Right? Snapshot isolation that we talked about so far is super easy because first writer wins, and then therefore one transaction cannot write to the same tuple of another transaction. But if I'm running at like uh, read uncommitted or, or read committed, then I don't know whether maybe I, if, if the, you know, I run it the first time on, on, on Monday, the, 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 the first transaction updates the tuple and the second tra transaction updates the second you know, the, after the first one. Then I crash and now on Tuesday I replay the log and all I have is just the operation that they modified. I may end up with a different ordering where the second transaction runs first and the first transaction runs after that. And again, technically it's correct because it would be equivalent to some, you know, say, because uh, you know, there weren't any torn writes. Like, at a high level, they're still correct, but it's not the state I had the day before, and therefore my recovery failed, right? Because I may have exposed something to the outside world about the order in which those transactions modify the database, but I come back to the second time and I can't restore that state. The other major issue, and this is probably the one that, that, that is... Uh, easier to understand, probably why nobody actually, very few systems actually do logical logging, is that it's going to take you longer to do recovery because now you need to re-execute all those queries in your log all over again, right? So if my, say in the case of my uh, one query updates a billion tuples, if doing that update on a billion tuples took an hour, then the second time around when I replay the log, it's still going to take another hour. It doesn't matter that, that I'm in recovery mode, it's always going to take that long. Whereas it may be the case because the physical logging is saying like update these low level bits, that can probably be applied more efficiently than having to rerun the query all over again. All right? So I think for this reason, I think uh, nobody actually implements this. You see this in other cases of replication, but uh, in general, everyone always does physical logging, to the best of my knowledge. All right, so the paper I had you guys read uh, was based on the system called Silo. And this is an example of, of a physical logging scheme for an in-memory database system. So again, just like in, in last class, we're focused here on OLTP systems or OLTP workloads because OLAP workloads are read-only, so we don't, we don't have to do any logging. It's really focusing on doing transactional updates to the database. So Silo is a very influential system. Um, it was created by the same authors that, uh, that invented Mastery that we talked about a few lectures ago. Right, so this project was led by Eddie Kohler, who is a professor at Harvard. The dude's amazing. Like, uh, um, if you ever used hot crap for like submissions of papers, he he invented that and still maintains it. Um, he's 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 one of the best systems programmers that I know. So, Silo is going to be a single version system that uses OCC with the same kind of epoch-based garbage collection that we talked about so far. So. We'll see in a second, the single version is not going to affect us too much, but there are things, in particular with checkpoints, that make our, uh, if we're being multi-versioned or using MVCC, our life is a lot easier. All right, but for single version, it, th they're fine. All right, so they're going to use physical logging with checkpoints to show to durability transactions, 
And one of the key overarching themes about how Silo is going to be implemented is that they're going to try to avoid any kind of centralized data structure or centralized coordination between different threads because that's going to slow us down. So they want to be able to run the logging in parallel, writing out the parallel log files and, and generating the log records in parallel without avoiding you know, having a single bottleneck for the entire system. So the way it's going to work is that for each CPU socket in our system, so Silo is a shared memory or shared, sorry, shared everything database system, so it only runs on a single node, just like we've been talking about so far this entire semester. And the way it's going to be work is that for every single CPU socket, it's going to have some, some local threads that are running on the same socket to it. And so every CPU socket will have a bunch of worker threads, uh, a bunch of checkpointing threads, and then a single thread designated as the logger thread. And that logger thread is responsible for, for writing out to disk uh, the modifications made by the, the worker threads running on that same socket. And so each socket is now also going to have a dedicated uh, storage device in order to, to maximize parallelism and not have any interference with other, other sockets or other logger, thre logger threads running to other devices. So that means that for every CPU socket to get the best performance in silo, every CPU socket needs to have its own dedicated hard drive that it writes to. All right, so as the worker is going to execute, are going to execute transactions, they're going to create new log records that, that, that contain the values that, 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 that they overwrote or they installed into the database. And again, we don't care about logging out the disk, the undo information. We only care about redo. And then at some, some point, it's going to hand off the redo information that it generates for transactions to its logger thread, and the logger thread will write that out the disk. So the first issue is now where are we going to get the memory for the, the log records that we're generating? Right? Again, we, want, we don't want to just malloc on the heap. right? We want to make sure that we have uh, the, the physical location of our memory is close to our logger thread, and that it, it can grab it real quickly and then write, write it out the disk. So again, the, so the, what's going to happen is the worker threads are going to have to go to it, their, their dedicated logger thread, and they're going to say, hey, give me a log buffer, which is just a byte array that it can, that it can install log records to. And then at some point when the, that log buffer gets full, it hands it back to the logger thread, say, hey, you know, here's my changes in this, log, in this log buffer, write it out the disk, and then it goes and tries to get another log buffer from the free pool that the logger thread has. Right? So if there's no more free buffers left, then we have to stall our worker thread, because otherwise we, we would be generating log records faster than we can get rid of them, or the logger thread can get rid of them and write them out the disk. Because right, then at some point you're going to have, you know, you're going to run out of memory because you have all these log records that, you're, they're, you're, that are queued up waiting to get rid out, written out of the disk. So this is not just specific to Silo. This is pretty much every single in-memory database or every, you know, in-memory database that's actually running in the real world. You would specify ahead of time the amount of memory you want to allocate or designate for your log buffers. In Silo, it's 10%, right? There's no magical number. It, it, it varies on the database, varies on the application. So it basically means in silo R, 10% of the memory of the entire system will be allocated for log buffers. Right, so again, if I run out of memory my, in my log buffers, my threads just stall. And then at some point, the, log, the logger will say, all right, if I flushed everything out, frees up a bunch of memory, and then hands them out to the free memory pool, and then the worker threads can pick them up and start running. So the log files themselves, as I said, they're just going to be grabbing these log buffers that the worker threads generate, and just appends them to this file. So the way they're going to organize this is that the logger thread is going to keep, for each epoch, which I'll explain what that is in a second, for each epoch, it's going to just take all the log buffers that it has and that, that are waiting to get written out, and then writes it out. And then after about 10 epochs, sorry, 100 epochs, it's going to close that file, create a new file, and start appending the log records to that. Right? And the idea here is it's going to make it easier to manage your files because now you're going to know, have an easy way to, to figure out which log files are old, which log files are new, and can, you can easily truncate the log without having to reorganize you know, one single giant log file. So this is a common approach. This is not specific to silo. You see this all the time. So here's actually a screenshot of the this MySQL 5.7 of a MySQL installation that I help run here in, in, in the CS department. And so 
you see right here, they, this is the older version. I think they renamed these files in the newer version. But there's these two log files, log file zero, log file, zero, log file one. So what happens is when the a log file gets to be 500 megs, then they close that file and create a new one. Right? So then once I know that um, I've, 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 you know, if, if I close this one and there's no open transaction that could be spanning these two log files, it's safe for me to, to blow this away if I want to. Right? If, I'm, if I care about auditing, then I need to keep this around because I need to know what transactions I ran. But there's nothing in here I need to worry about for, for recovery because I, I would have had a checkpoint too. But we can ignore that. So again, this is just a way to make it easier for, for, for humans to manage the, actual, the log files that the data system is generating. Um, so for each log record that we're going to store, it's just going to be a triplet that contains the, the name of the table that was modified by this, by this operation, the, some kind of record key or tuple ID to say, here's how to uniquely identify the record or tuple that we modified. And then, then the value would be sort of a list of, of pairs of attribute name to new value. Right? So let's say that I have a simple query like this. We have a people table. We want to set some is lame flag for both Lynn and myself. So the corresponding log records would just look like this. Right? For transaction 1001, we updated the people table. Here's some unique identifiers for my record and, and Lynn's record. And then we have the, the, the mapping for the attribute to the new value. Right? Again, this is the redo. We don't care about the undo. All right. So let's look at a, a large perspective of how silo R is going to work. Right? So we're going to break up the three different components of, of, of our system. So this would be running on, on one socket. We have our worker threads, we have the logger thread, and then we have storage where we're actually going to store our log files. And then for this, we have an epoch thread. This is the same epoch garbage collection that we talked about before. Um, it's just some other thread that's every so often is going to increment this epoch counter. And then everyone synchronizes and say, all right, at, the, at, at this epoch, you know, we need to do something. All right, they want to do, they're using this as a way to uh, having to avoid to synchronize in fine-grained steps as you run transactions. It's sort of this coarse-grained batch to say, all right, Every so often, then everyone's going to everyone's going to synchronize when this thing increments. All right. So say that we have our, uh, our we have a transaction request that's going to start working in, in in one of our worker threads or start getting executed on our worker threads. So again, in silos parlance, they call these one-shot transactions, right? Where you have the embedded logic of the of the of the transaction along with its queries running directly inside the database itself. In database world, this is what. Store procedures, right? Same, same thing, different name. All right, so this store procedure starts, ex starts executing, starts updating the database, so we need to generate log records. So we have to go to our logger thread that's dedicated for this worker and get one of its log buffers from the free buffer pool. So then once it has that, the, the transaction can start running and makes much modifications, right? And it puts, puts all its log records in here. We update the state of the database. And at some point, this thing gets full. So we're going to hand it off back to the logger thread, say, hey, this thing's full, write it out to disk, uh, and then we go and try to get the, a new log buffer, right? So now, at some point, the, the epoch manager, or sorry, the epoch thread will say, all right, we're, we're, we're transitioning now into a new epoch. So now when this happens, all of the worker threads have to hand off their log buffers to the logger thread, regardless of whether it's full or not. Right, because this is the point we, we, we're trying to synchronize on. So we hand this off now. Um, and now this worker thread, we're in the new epoch. It could start executing more transactions again. But because we don't have a log buffer, we got to go back and get one of the free ones. But in this example here, there's no more free ones because they're all being queued up, waiting to get written out the disk. So when this happens, we have to stall our worker thread because there's no log buffers for us to write into. All right? Then our logger thread in the background will start flushing out the, or writing out the, 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 these log buffers to the log files, you know, calls fsync to make sure that they're actually fully synchronized on disk. Um, and then when that's, when that's done, it can then go back, take whatever log buffers it's written out, put them back to the free pool, then notify this guy that they're, they're now available so it can pick one up and actually start running it. So, yes? Um, can the worker thread use the same buffer for more than one transaction? His question is, can, the, can a worker thread use the same buffer for more than one transaction? Yes. So the way silo R works, you can essentially think of these as or executing transactions in batches. So transactions don't commit 
until the, the epoch switches, which I think in silo is 40 milliseconds. I asked them why it was 40 milliseconds and not some other number. They said they just picked it, you know, they just pulled it out of the air. Right? So it's 40 is not magical. So everyone's going to validate and synchronize at, at that at that when the epoch transitions. Okay. So that's the single case where we have uh, one socket, one worker thread, one logger thread. Now let's look at the case when we want to start scaling this out, or scale, sorry, scaling this up on our single box, and now have multiple sockets with multiple threads running at the same time. So the issue we're trying to deal with is that if we're, not, we're trying to avoid coordinating between the different sockets, then we need to somehow figure out to keep track of where each a log file has, how far each log file has, has, has written in our time scale of our epochs. Again, without having them check all the time. So they're going to introduce this new special log thread called the, the, that's going to maintain this thing called the persistent epoch or, or p epoch. And that's just going to be a log file that's going to keep track of the highest epoch that it knows has been, has been flushed to disk and is durable across all the sockets logger threads, right? So, and then what's going to happen is we say that a transaction can only be considered fully committed, and therefore we can send back an acknowledgment to the application server to saying your transaction is committed. Once we know that uh, the epoch that it ran in is less than or equal to the, 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 the latest persistent epoch. Because right, this, this guarantees that we know that no matter where the, what, what, on what socket this transaction may have modified some, ta some data, we know that all its log records have, been, have made it out to disk. So let's look at a, a larger example here. So again, now we have in our database, we have three CPUs, right? And each of these CPUs are going to have a logger thread that are, again, writing to a dedicated storage device that, that that's, that's only this guy can write to. All right, so then we have our worker threads. And again, these guys are just getting log buffers, as we, as we showed before, already filling them up as it runs transactions, and then handing them off to the logger thread. But then we have an additional logger thread here, uh, some special one that's been designated as the persistent epoch, which I'm designating by the crown here. And then it's going to record this persistent epoch log file on one of the drives. It doesn't matter which one, right? It just, just pick, pick one. So what's going to happen is that uh, as, as, sorry, going back here, when this thing increments and we go up to 200, it's gonna, that's going to then trigger all these guys to try to write out all the log records that come from this point or before. And then once we know that our, our three logger threads have, have written out the log records that correspond to this epoch, then we're allowed to have the persistent epoch thread update this log record and say, all of these have, are, have, have, have written out up to this, this epoch number. So, while well, I, I fully admit, after thinking about this, I actually don't think you need this. Right? This is a nice to have, not required to have. So, if you don't have this, then all you really need to do is just, when you boot the system up, go figure out, like, uh, what was the, what, you know, what's the highest epoch that all of your, your logger threads actually wrote to. Right? Because the state, you still need to know that everyone has written out up to this epoch in memory, because that's how you tell whether the outside world, whether a transaction has committed or not. But you actually don't need this thing, um, because when you come back, you can then figure that out just by looking at the log files. So I think that's correct. I think you don't need this, but it makes your life easier when you boot back up. You have to do less work. Not 100% sure, but I think that's the case. So any questions about the persistent epoch? Oh, but everyone understands it immediately. Okay. All right, cool. All right, so let's talk about now how do we actually recover after a crash. So again, remember I said that every recovery protocol has two parts. It has what you do at runtime, then what you, and then it has what you do after, after a crash, and it needs to recover the database. So in silo R, they're going to do essentially what every in-memory database is going to do. You're going to have two phases. The first phase, you're going to load in the last checkpoint that you took, to restore the, the state of the database up, up into that checkpoint. And this is also where we rebuild all our indexes because remember I said that we're not writing those indexes out to disk. As we stream the data in from, from the disk from the checkpoint, then we rebuild the indexes. Right? Reading data from disk is way more expensive than 
building an index. So when we looked at some of the, the BW tree and the mass tree and the B plus tree, you know, those guys were doing like five to 10 million inserts per second. Right? That's, that's, that's fast enough for us to be able to rebuild this and it's not worth the penalty of having to read data from disk. All right, so then once we have our, uh, once we have our, our checkpoint loaded, then we want to start replaying the log to put us back into the correct state we were supposed to be in at the moment that the system crashed or went down. Right, so the checkpoint will get you up to some point, but then you need to replay all the log records that, that got generated after that checkpoint. So one of the interesting things that's, that Silo R is going to do that's different than how you traditionally talk about log recovery is that they're going to replay the log in reverse order. Meaning they're going to start with the newest log record and go backwards in time and replay log records. And that's somewhat different than how we talked about Aries, right? Because Aries is all about figuring out at what point do I need to start in the log and then replay forward in time. Silo R is going backwards. And what they do is they keep track of the, uh, they keep track of what tuples they've modified as they're replaying the log so that if they recognize that if I'm going back in time and I, and I see I, I updated, I have a log record that modified tuple A, and then I go back in time a little farther, and there's another log record that also updates tuple A. I want the first one that I saw, because again, that's the latest one, so I know I don't even have to bother with replaying the, uh, any other modification of that same tuple afterwards. Right? If, you're going for, if you're going forward in time, then you don't know what the latest version is going to be, right? so you have to replay every log record as, as, you, as, you, as you find them, as you encounter them as you replay the log. If you go in reverse order, you don't have to do that. The other interesting aspect about this is that the, the transaction IDs are going to be enough for us to figure out at runtime what the serial order should be for our transactions. So Silo R is a serializable system, so we can use our transaction IDs to figure out uh, the correct ordering of, of transactions on, upon replay. So that part is kind of nice as well. Because you sort of and you can do this all independently because every thread, every, every socket is going to have its own logger thread or, or, or their own log file that's going to replay. And we don't have to wor worry about any ordering issues across different log files because we know that the, for a given transaction, it only can modify data that's maintained or managed by that socket if it's in that log file. All right, so to do replay. We're going to go first check the P epoch file to determine what is the most recent persistent epoch. And again, I say we actually don't need we don't need this. It's a, it's a, it's, just, it's a convenience thing. So if we find any log record that comes after the persistent epoch, then we know we should ignore it. Because again, it's not like when the when the when the epoch number flips, then everything gets written out to disk. The logger threads are writing out the disk all the time because they have, they have to get you know free up space from the log buffers. So it may be the case we, we do a persistent epoch check. We f everybody flushes out their, the log buffers that they have, and then before the next epoch gets incremented, a bunch of other log records get written out. So we know when we come back, since those log records come after the the, the highest persistent epoch that I've maintained, I know I can ignore them because those guys actually never committed. Uh, they, they committed internally, but we didn't expose any of their changes to the outside world. The outside world didn't, doesn't know that they actually committed. So therefore, we can, we can roll back, we can abort those changes, or sorry, we just ignore them. All right, and as I said it's already before, we're going to replay the log records from newest to oldest, uh, and then we check to see whether our tuples already existed or we've already modified, it, and if so, we can skip it. Yes? Uh, but what, uh, what if we do not have the PE and we try to uh, get the latest persistent epoch by the highest uh, epoch in the log file, then, then this rec log record will not be ignored. So yeah, so he said if you don't have the persistent epoch, then uh, then you you may not be able to ignore the transactions that did not commit. So you have to do a, you have to do a second pass, you have to do a, uh, one initial pass to look at all the log files and say what's the highest epoch that everyone has. Right, that's essentially what the epoch does, the persistent epoch does for you. So you do one pass to figure out what's the highest one everyone has, and then you do a second pass where you replay and you ignore the ones that are that are that come after that that high high water mark. It's the same idea. Yeah. Is that clear for everyone? Okay. 
All right, so uh, let's go back to our example here and see how we'd actually do recovery on this. So again, we have our persistent epoch thread. It loads that in, figures out what the persistent epoch is across all these, these uh, log files. And then it's going to instantiate a bunch of replay uh, threads, which I shows a dump truck. I don't know what else to show this, right? Because they're not doing, they're not workers. They're not executing transactions. They're just replaying the log. So all of these guys now will then get updated uh, with this persistent epoch number, and therefore they know what they need, they, they, they need it to install, right? And all this, all this runs in parallel. Uh, you load the first checkpoint, then they all replay their log files, and then you're done. And now you're back to the persistent state you were in at the moment of, of, cra of the crash. OK? OK. So I like this paper again because I think it's, it's a, a well-written description of how to do uh, high-performance physical logging in a in-memory database. So it's not the only way to do it, but I think it's, 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 it's one of those sort of straightforward discussions and implementations. So as I said in the beginning, it's the, the disk is, is, is going to be the slowest part. Um, so we want to try to avoid the, the slowdown uh, because of this as much as possible. So the thing we can do, and Silo R already does this, but this is sort of general advice for in-memory databases in general, actually disk-based databases in general as well, is that rather than when, when a transaction commits, rather than waiting for its log records to get flushed out the disk before you allow anybody else to start processing on the data that the, the, transa the, the waiting transaction uh, modified or generated, you can actually maybe let them run speculatively, and uh, and then just you know and, and 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 let the background thread do all the writing, and then we go ahead and run our transactions, uh, you know, as if they've already been written to disk, even though they haven't. So there's a couple of techniques to do this. So the first way is called group commit. The basic idea is this: is that uh, I'll have a transaction, rather than sort of doing f-sync for every single transaction when they flush, they will do it, uh, do a bunch of batch of transactions all at once, and then uh, and sort of amortize the cost of that f-sync. So silo R is already sort of doing that. When a transaction commits, uh, I don't have to immediately hand off the log buffer to the logging thread. The next transaction come along, and it can append new log records to that same log buffer. So essentially, they're getting batched up and then written out uh, together. So this is called group commit. It's a sort of obvious idea, but it's it's an old one, right? It goes back into the the, the 1980s. Maybe back then it was it was considered mind blowing. So this was originally developed uh, for this thing called Fast Path. So IMS is one of the, the first data systems that IBM built for the you know the, the NASA Moon mission in the 1960s, and then they came out in the 1980s was a sort of in memory optimized engine, this, the same way Hecaton's an optimized engine for uh, SQL Server called Fast Path. Um, it's hard to read the fast pass papers because like it's like these old tech reports and the, the language is kind of confusing. Yes? Is it possible for a transaction to log to span across multiple log buffers? So this question is, is it possible for a transactions the, the, modif the transactions log records to span across multiple log buffers? Yes. Why not? Then like in that case, like what if like one of them sent off to uh, the log record and it's like persisted it, but the other half of the transactions log record is not persisted? So this question is, well, what happens if uh, my log records are split across two buffers, the first one gets written, and then the second one doesn't get written? Well, again, so, so it has to do with the, that in the case of silo R, that's the persistent epoch. So when I hit my persistent epoch, all log buffers have to get written. Now, how do you handle transactions that span epochs? That's, that's a side story. But all the log buffers have to get written out the disk before that, that persistent epoch is actually considered finished, or before you write that persistent epoch record. And then once I know it's been flushed and my persistent epoch record has been written, then I can tell the outside world that my transaction is committed. So the transaction commits. It's not going to do any more work. It's generated all the log records it's going to generate, but I don't tell the outside world that it's finished until I, all its log buffers are written. Right, it's the same thing with group commit. Group commit, might, you might have, uh, if you're not using silo R, if you're using like a you know, sort of MVCC system that we've talked about before, you could have in a single batch of data being written out to disk changes from committed transactions and uncommitted transactions, right? And it's up to you in the recovery protocol to figure out which ones you, which ones are actually correct or not. All right, so I'm going to try to go through this very quickly because I want to get to checkpoints. Um, so 
The other optimization we do is the same thing we talked about with speculative reads, with Hecaton. So I have a change from an uncommitted transaction. Rather than waiting for it to get written out to disk, I just let anybody else read it. I maintain some internal metadata in my database system to, to know that this transaction read a, a, a record that was modified by this other transaction. I can't tell the outside world that I've committed until I know that that, that first transaction's log record has been written to disk. Right, so they call this early lock release. It's the same thing as the speculative read stuff that we talked about before. All right, so in the sake of time, I'm going to skip command logging. Again, this is like, there's so many things I wanted to talk about. Um, I, I want to get to the stuff that I actually think that is uh, the most common, which you actually see in the real world. OK, so uh, for the logging protocols, again, whether it's logical logging or physical logging, we have the same issue. And that is the log file is going to grow infinitely. Meaning if I crash, I have to replay the entire log to put me back into the correct state. And obviously, if I have a one year's worth of log records, I, my recovery time could take one year, depending on what scheme I'm using. So the, the way we can overcome this is through checkpoints. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to say, let's take a snapshot of the database as it exists at some point in time, write that out the disk. Then when I crash and, and need to recover, I load that checkpoint in, and then the only log I need to replay is just whatever came in after that I took my checkpoint. Right? So checkpoints are going to allow us to reduce the recovery time significantly by taking periodic snapshots of the database. So there's a bunch of different ways that we can do this for an in-memory database. Right? Aries is the canonical way that you would do this in, in a disk-based system using fuzzy checkpoints and whatnot. Um, for an in-memory database, we have a bunch of different options which we can go over. Uh, and what I'll say also, too, is that it's oftentimes wh whatever approach you're going to end up using for the different uh, you know, choices we're going to have, we, we talk about in a second, it's usually very, very tightly coupled with whatever the concurrency protocol is. So whether you're single version or multi-version. If you're multi-version, then like, uh, you know, doing snapshots are quite easy because you just disable uh, you know, garbage collection and just do a long-running you know, long query. Um, the other important thing to understand about checkpoints is that we don't want the, or we want to minimize the overhead or influence on performance from a checkpoint operation. Uh, we want to minimize the influence that they have over the performance of, of the actual queries running, or the, the worker threads running our transactions. Because it would really suck if like, we're running, running our checkpoint and now our system is 50% slower. Right? So usually the, the conventional wisdom is like a 10 to 15% overhead for checkpoints is, is acceptable. That's what Silo R has. I think that's what, what VoltDB has as well. Right? Because again, we're writing stuff out the disk for our checkpoint. But we're also still trying to write log records. So we have interference on our log files as, you know, on the disk drives as we try to write to them. Plus we have these worker threads actually doing computational work to figure out what our checkpoint should look like and copy things into memory and, and prepare to write out the disk. So we're going to avoid the overhead as much as possible. So typically what we're going to do is we're going to do asynchronous flushes or asynchronous writes to disk and not worry about uh, you know, that, that every single write is durable at, 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 at an exact moment of time. Now when we do the final write for the last buffer, yes, we want to make sure that's durable so we know that our checkpoint is complete. But it's not like log records where you know, or we're, we're going to do f-syncs all the time. All right, so there's this paper written by Dana Boddy, who wrote the column store paper that we talked about a, a few uh, lectures ago. Um, and he wrote in 2016 that talks about some ideal properties you, you want to have in a checkpoint protocol for in-memory database. And these are essentially obvious, but it's sort of keep these in the back of our mind as we go forward to talk about these different approaches, because we want to make sure that we don't violate any of these. So as I already said, we don't want to slow down our regular transaction processing, because that's going to be unacceptable for people. Related to this, we don't want, want any unacceptable latency spikes. So we don't want to have the checkpoint have to write a, a you know, shit ton of data all at once. And then now our, our, all our transactions have you know, their latency you know, triple in time. Because right? people want stability in their workload. They don't want these weird oscillations because we're writing things out to disk. And this won't really be, be an issue too much with us uh, for the protocols we'll talk about here. But there's other techniques that do a lot of copying but in general, we want to avoid having excessive memory overhead because that's, it's temporary memory where you have to use for our checkpoint because we're just going to write out the disk, and that could cause us to have pressure on our regular memory uh, allocations for the, the, you know, for the database. And we don't want to run out of memory because we're taking a checkpoint. 
Again, the protocols I'll talk about here are, are, are a bit lightweight, so this is an issue. But there's other protocols that are like lat tree or lock free, and you know, take you know, they'll triple the size of your database when you when you use them. But as far as I know, nobody does that. All right, so let's talk about a bunch of different design decisions we have for checkpoints. So the first is that what kind of checkpoint do we want to take? And again, this is just from the introduction class, right? We talked about this in the context of Aries. But you basically can have either a consistent checkpoint or a fuzzy checkpoint. A consistent checkpoint means that the snapshot of the database that's getting written to disk is, is, can only contain the changes from committed transactions. Think of this just the same thing as snapshot isolation. So I start my checkpoint and I ignore any changes in my database in my checkpoint from transactions that, that were running but uncommitted at the time I took my checkpoint. So you can think of this as just like doing a sequential scan of the entire table within a snapshot and we write that out the disk. So the reason why this is, this is ideal is because we don't have to do any extra work on recovery to figure out what transactions actually uh, committed or not. Right? So if, if, you, if you do a fuzzy checkpoint, then you actually do need the undo records. Uh, and that's why most systems don't actually do this. Right? So the fuzzy checkpoints, as I said before, it could have changes from trans transactions that have not committed. If they are, if it's a multi-version system, then it's not a big deal because you just know what version should, should, should be the last version or the most recently committed version. If it's a single version system, then you have to have undo records. And you have to do additional processing when you restart to make sure you remove any of those changes. All right, so now we're gonna talk about how we're actually gonna create the checkpoint. So the most common approach is just to do it yourself in the database system. So again, the thing that the most naive checkpoint scheme or, or, or a mechanism would be sequential scan on, on a table and take the output of the scan and write it out to, to disk, right? We can be, be a bit more clever about this and maybe just look at like the delta records if we're doing delta versioning. Right? There's different techniques, but the basic idea is that it's up for the data system to figure out what, what, is, what is the checkpoint and write that out. The alternative approach, which again, as far as I know, nobody does this. Hyper used to do this, which I'll show in the next slide, but is that since we're an in-memory database, the database is entirely in memory. So let's fork the process, right? And then we have the child process that, 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 that comes out of the fork also has to copy the database in memory. We, and then we just write out, have that separate child process, write that out to disk and leave the parent process, the original process to do whatever it wants to do. Right? So the reason why this works is because, uh, and it's, it's not as bad as you think it is, is because the OS is going to do copy and write memory allocations. So ignoring you know, transactions running at the same time, if I have two processes and I fork, sorry, I have one process, I have, I have a bunch of memory that, that, that I've allocated, I do a fork now. It's not like the OS is going to make a copy of the contents of, the, of that process's address space and put it into a new location for my child process. It knows that you know, it's a fork, and therefore there's actually a mapping from the virtual memory pages from the child process to the physical pages of, the, of, the, of its original parent process. And only when the parent process or the child process tries to modify those pages, then it actually makes a copy of it. So I can do this and then just have, again, the, 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 the child process will have a copy of memory. Now, if there, if there are running transactions, then I do, need to do a bunch of extra work in the child process to treat them, those guys as the border transactions and start undoing those changes, right? And they put me back into a consistent state. The other downside of this approach is that it copies everything. So in this case here, we know we only care about writing out the, the, data, the, the table uh, chunks of memory for the tuples. This thing copies everything. So whatever internal data structures we have for our system, they get copied, and any indexes also get copied as well even though we, do, we don't even care about uh, you know, writing those guys out. So this is actually what Hyper used to do in the very first version. So the, 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 the version of Hyper you guys read about is what they built after the, this first version here. So this first version was actually was heavily influenced on the system I helped build called HDOR, and they followed some of the same ideas that we did for that original system. And then they realized if you want to do HTAP workloads or OLAP queries on your system, then the HDOR model is, is insufficient or is not what you want to do. But in the first version, what they would do is that everything was in C++. If I want to run an OLAP query or take a checkpoint, I fork my process. Then the child process undoes any transactions that were sort of running at the time that I did my fork, because they're not running any, anymore in the child process. 
And then I can take whatever was in there, now I have a consistent snapshot, and I can write that to the disk, or I can run OLAP queries, right? So they end up abandoning this because the copy and write overhead from the OS actually becomes quite significant, right? Because again, I'm trying to run transactions as fast as possible on the parent process. They're gonna start dirtying up a bunch of pages, both for indexes, internal data structures. So all of a sudden the OS is gonna start doing a bunch of copies immediately after the child gets forked and your performance is gonna drop. So they end up abandoning this and they switch to the MVCC model that you guys read about. So, I, so when this paper came out in 2011, I was like, oh, that's sort of a clever idea. That's interesting. Uh, and I was in grad school so at the time, so I didn't have, I didn't have enough time to implement it this myself. But then I en en ended up implementing this when I came to CMU with, with a master's student my first semester. Um, and this is just a sort of a simple experiment showing the performance of the system of HDOR when you do uh, when you when you do this kind of forking process. So the original version of Hyper was in C++. Uh, HDOR, like VoltDB, is is C++ plus Java. So you have a Java front end for networking and query planning and, qu and store procedures. And then the execution engine is all in C++. So technically, it's, it's, it's JVM with off-heap memory and off-heap uh, query execution. So what would happen here is that we would do the fork at this time here. So this is just running like TPCC. And then we would run the OLAP query on the, on the snapshot. So here you see the performance of the, of the parent process. And then red is the performance of the child process. So the first time you do the snapshot, everything sucks. Then I think the second time you do the snapshot, the, 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 the snapshot doesn't actually do that bad. I forget why. Um, the two things I'll say about this. So we still, still have the same bottleneck that, or the issue of the OS starts copying a bunch of pages as, as they get modified in the hypercase. It's actually even worse than this. Uh, this is actually, uh, since we're in Java, if you read the documentation for the JVM, they say don't fork it. You're gonna have a bad, you know, it's a bad idea. We said, fuck that, let's fork it. Uh, <laughs> and you have, you have to, you have, it's a bad idea. Because what happens is in these managed memory environments like the JVM, it's not just your thread that's running your application. They have a bunch of other background threads like the garbage collector and other system threads that are doing stuff. So when you fork it, those other threads aren't, aren't alive in the child process. They're now all, all dead because it's only the, 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 whatever thread called fork is what gets, you know, is running in the child process. So you're like in this weird zombie JVM because you don't have a garbage collector, you don't have this, you know, the other stuff you expect to have. Then the garbage collector kicks kicks in over on the uh, on on the, on the on the on the parent process, and that starts reorganizing the heap, which then calls a bunch of OS memory writes. So that was a bad idea, which is fine. We just want to see whether it would work. Um, yeah, I, I I I'm interested. I don't remember why why this is this is fine and this thing still still tanks. Um, Oh, you know what? Sorry, I take that back. I think this is this is this is the regular H store, and this is H store with the JVM forking, right? So in regular H store, the OLAP query ties up all the threads, and that's why it bottlenecks here. In the H store with the snapshot, and this is what the TPCC number, right? So this just shows you that like when you do the snapshot, the reason why it's it takes a while to recover from the snapshot is because this is all the OS memory writes. The bottom line is it's a bad idea, and nobody actually does this. And it's, don't do it if you have the JVM. All right, so we talk about what kind of checkpoints we want to take. So the two choices are to do a complete checkpoint or a delta checkpoint. A complete checkpoint is literally the entire database as it exists in memory written out the disk. So if I take a checkpoint now, my database is 100 gigabytes, I take a checkpoint, I have a 100 gigabyte file, I, I can compress it, but we can ignore that. I have a 100 gigabyte file, then I take a checkpoint 10 minutes later, but within that 10 minutes, I only updated maybe one gigabyte of the database. My next checkpoint is gonna be another 100 gigs. So the way to overcome this is to do delta checkpoints, which is you just write out the, the tuples that were modified since the last checkpoint you took. So the way you could figure this out is could keep a bitmap to keep track of what pages or what blocks got modified since the last time. Or you can actually look at the log, because this is essentially looking like the log, and just have that rep be represented as, as the checkpoint. So I would say, we'll see in, in, a, in a few slides what most, what in memory systems do, everyone pretty much does this one. And I think it's a combination of, it's easy to implement, and it provides sort of people with peace of mind or comfort to know that here's a single checkpoint file that has my snapshot of my database, and I can ship that around to another machine, like I, I know it's there and I, I know it's safe. 
Whereas this thing is going to generate a bunch of deltas. And if one of those files gets trashed, I might end up losing, you know, losing the entire thing. All right, so the, the last issue we got to talk about is when do we take a checkpoint? So the most obvious way to do this is that every five minutes or every 10 minutes or so, I just take another checkpoint. Right? And this is usually something that humans have to tune because the time in between each checkpoint, the interval in, in between each checkpoint, will determine how big your log file is after a crash. And that will correspond to how long it's going to take for you to recover after a restart. So I think a Volt DB, the default is five minutes. I forget what other systems do. Another approach is to base it on how much data you've written out to the log file. So in the case of MemSQL, they say, if I write out a half a gig of database, 250 megs, to my log file, then that will, that will trigger a new checkpoint. And that sort of bounds the amount of time you have to take to recover it, in theory, uh, you know, modulo some, some constants of, of what you're actually modifying. But that'll bound the amount of time uh, based on you know, you know, how much data has actually been written as well. And this can avoid the issue of like, if your database is not that active at night, you're not now taking a checkpoint every five minutes or 10 minutes, you're just doing it whenever the, the, you know, the log file gets updated. The last approach is not really an option. So to, if you're gonna implement checkpoints, you, implement, you, have, you have to implement either one of these two. Right? They're, 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 either, they're either or. This last one here is sort of you have to do because it'd be retarded not to do this. Uh, and that is you take a checkpoint whenever somebody asks you to shut down. Right? So you don't do kill-9 on your database system. You have, that's going to be a bad idea. <laughs> you politely ask the database system to shut down. It basically uh, blocks any new connections. It acquiesces all, all the worker threads. Right? Any transaction that may be still running, it's allowed to finish within some time limit. And then at some point when you know no, there's no more transactions running, then you go ahead and initiate the checkpoint. Once that's durable on disk, then you actually can, can truly shut down, right? So this is a little table from some of the major in-memory databases and the different approaches that they use. And again, everyone's doing different things. So the, the, in my opinion, the most common one would be consistent. Um, and that's what MemSQL, VoltDB, and Hecaton use. Uh, but you see that like the, the timestamp is doing fuzzy um, if you do a non-blocking one. But they have a blocking version as well. And then uh, Han is doing fuzzy. So what's interesting about this is that fuzzy checkpoints traditionally are associated with single version systems, right? Because I need to have transactions running at the same time. Uh, and there only, there's only one version of, of a tuple, and they're all modifying it. So therefore, you would think fuzzy checkpointing would be done in a single version system, like what VoltDB is, right? And Han is a, is a, is a multi-version system. But it's reversed. HANA, for whatever reason, is doing fuzzy checkpoints, and VoltDB is doing consistent checkpoints. Right? Think, think MVC, MVCC. If I have a consistent snapshot, that's a consistent you know, checkpoint. So the way VoltDB actually does this is that they switch into this like, multi-version mode when you take a checkpoint. It's really two versions. It's like the version that existed when I, my checkpoint started. But normally, it's always single version. Most systems are doing complete, complete checkpoints. Uh, only uh, Hecaton is doing delta checkpoints. And the way they're handling this is that they're basically doing compaction on the logs. So you have one log file that says, here's all the tuples that got deleted. Here's all the tuples that got updated or inserted. And then it compacts them into uh, sort of a, a smaller log file or, you know, or checkpoint file that represents the state of the database. Right? And then how they actually do the, the, the what, what, and what frequency they're doing uh, checkpoints is all over the map. For Altabase, I looked in the manual. Um, or the documentation, and it didn't look like they had periodic checkpoints. Maybe it changed. I mean, there's a command to invoke a checkpoint, but I couldn't see a way to, to set it up to do it automatically. All right, so any questions about checkpoints? Yes? What was Peloton? So this question is, what, was, what did Peloton use? So uh, we never had checkpoints. So we were going to, <laughs> I mean, we still don't have checkpoints now. This is actually be a project I'll discuss on, on Wednesday. I want checkpoints, yes. We were going to do consistent checkpoints based on time frequency. We never got that far. Um, we, we never got logging correct, work correctly either. We have that now. Yes? Is there a reason you want time frequency rather than log file? So this question is, is there any, uh, is there any reason you would want time frequency versus the, the, log, the log threshold? So if your database is running 24-7, then the, 
sometimes there's SLOs or SLA guarantees you have to have to say, I'm guaranteed that my database can recover in this amount of time. Like if you're selling it as a service for somebody. So in that case, you could say, all right, I'll sell you my database system and I guarantee that you'll be able to recover in five minutes. So I set my frequency to be you know, four minutes. You'll pay again, pay a performance penalty because when you take a checkpoint, you know, you're, you're doing work other than running transactions, but this will guarantee that you come back very quickly. It's a good, good question. Yes? For the MVCC databases, how much, I mean, memory could spike if you've got lots of transactions going on when you kick off one of these snapshots, yeah. right? Yeah. So his, question, his statement is, for the multi-version database systems, your memory is going to spike when you take one of these checkpoints because it's the same thing, as I said, running a select query that if that's going to pause your garbage collector from actually cleaning things up because you're waiting for that one checkpoint thread to finish up. So this is where the techniques from the HANA paper we read comes into play. Like my checkpoint thread is running this old version, this old you know, this old snapshot. I have a bunch of crap that like I I, I can clean up because no one's ever going to read it. So that's why like being able to do interval interval garbage collection, the HANA guy, the way the HANA guys do it, is the right thing to do with with. Uh, if you want to do like sort of snapshot isolation checkpoints. That's why I had you guys read that paper. Okay, 10 minutes left, let's do this. All right, so everything I've talked about so far has assumed that we're trying to do restart our database system after a crash. Oops, sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Right, so, but not all restarts are going to be due to, to, a re, to a crash, right? Uh, there may be other cases where we need to restart the system in order to, to do maintenance things. So one example would be updating the operating system, right? Could be updating the machine, adding more RAM, fixing up a faulty drive, or it could also be updating the software, right? And this is problematic because if I have a, you know, a one terabyte database hanging out in memory, it's going to take me a long time to do a restart to, 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 to write that out the disk, restart the, the data system, and come back up and load it all back in. Right? And the reason why this is problematic is because, or the reason why uh, this is the case, at least for this, this second one here, why we want to try to avoid this is that it's sort of OS 101. The, the memory we allocate in our process is essentially tied to the lifetime of our process. So if we can, if we can decouple that, we can have our database live in memory, even though our database, our database process has restarted, then when we come back up, we can reclaim that memory and, and, and integrate it back into our system. So this is what Facebook came up with for their Scuba system. So I'll, I'll show what Scuba is in a second, but it was their basically their distributed in-memory database that they built to do event log processing. Right? You have a bunch of services, they're generating these, 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 these event records to say, I ran this PHP function for this long, or this packet went here, things like that. They're dumping this into this giant system, and they want to do analytics to find you know, what was the cause for a slowdown. So they're going to run on a very large fleet of, of hundreds of machines. Yeah, question. Okay, so they're going to run on a, on, a, on a fleet of like hundreds of machines, and you know, Facebook has sort of this agile development environment. They're trying to push out new updates every two or three weeks. So that means that every two, two or three weeks, you have a new version of your database system, and you need to be able to restart it to, to install the new version. If you have to like dump out the to data to disk and restart it every single time, that's going to be it's going to suck because you're going to have a large portion of your fleet at any given time just restarting, just reading data in from disk for no reason, just or just because you restart it. So the way they're going to handle this is that, as I said, since you want to decouple the in-memory contents of the database from the process lifetime. They're actually going to rely on shared memory in the operating system to dump the, the database contents in there. Then they can restart the database, come back, look in shared memory, because that's still living, and then, and then you know, suck it back into its, 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 its own process. So like I said, this is a really clever idea. It's sort of obvious when, if you look at it, but it's interesting to talk about. So real clicky, what is SCUBA? Uh, so as far as I know, Scuba is still actually used. As I said, it's a distributed in-memory system that's used for analytics. So this is not the primary storage location of like core you know, customer or user data at Facebook. This is just all like the internal event data. So if they lose it, it's not the end of the world. Like if you, it's not like you know, all your timeline and all your friend crap is actually stored in MySQL separately. 
So they're going to use what is called is a, is a heterogeneous distributed database system architecture. So they're going to have leaf nodes that are going to do all the scans on in-memory data and the filtering, and then they're going to shove that up to these aggregated nodes that are do group buys and aggregations and other things. And then it's sort of a, like a tree hierarchy. You keep doing these aggregations until you, you reach the final answer and you send that back to the client. So real quickly, it looks like this. So you have your, your, your leaf nodes, and you have the contents of the, of the database in memory, and then maybe they're out writing out some log files or checkpoint files. And then if I have a query, I'll, I'll break it up into fragments that are run on each of these leaf nodes. Each leaf node then operates on the data that has local to it, and they take the intermediate results and then send it to the aggregator node, which then combines it together from, from another leaf node. Right, this is a very common distributed system pattern that Facebook uses for a lot of their systems. Uh, the MemS this is how MemSQL works as well, because after he was at Microsoft, the fa the f one of the co-founders of MemSQL, after he went to Microsoft, Saul Hackathon got their ideas, then he went to Facebook for a year, saw sort of this general idea as well, and then that's what Facebook, that's what MemSQL is based on. Right, but it's, this, is not, you know, this is not unique to Facebook. This is, this is used in a bunch of other things. So again, the, the, the problem I'm trying to solve is be able to restart these leaf nodes here. These guys are stateless. We don't care. It's how can we, how can we restore the database after restart here? So there's two ways to do shared memory restarts. So the first is that we could have a special memory allocator that can allocate memory in, um, in shared memory for, for our database heaps. And then that's just, it's just how we use malloc. And so the, the rest of the system doesn't know that it's in shared memory. We just treat it as regular memory. And we just know that if we, if we restart the, 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 the database process to come back, we know where to look to find the data we want, and everything is, is, is just fine. So in the, in the SCUBA paper, they talked about how they, um, they investigated whether they could modify JE malloc or build their own version of malloc to do exactly this. And Facebook actually owns, or not owns, they employ the, the, guy, the inventor of J.E. Malloc. Uh, and so they asked him directly, like, hey, do you think this would actually would work? And the feedback they got, and they write this in the paper from this, they named the J.E. Malloc author by name. And they said that like with, the, with shared memory, you can't do lazy allocation of backing pages. So it means that if I have to allocate a, a bunch of space, normally with malloc, it's all virtual memory, so it's not going to actually be backed by physical pages. But in shared memory, you actually have to, the OS would actually back them immediately um, and that'll cause, cause fragmentation issues and sort of uh, performance issues. So this is what the paper says. In last class, so last year when I taught this, this is also what I said, because who am I to disagree with the inventor of J.E. Malik, right? And this is why I love the internet, is that uh, for this point here, that, that you, have, you can't do lazy allocation of backing pages with shared memory, some dude who I've never met, who is a, uh, a programmer at, in, in Dubai, uh, watched the video, and says, oh, I think you're wrong. And I said, well, here's the part in the paper that says this is what they're doing. Then he goes and actually checks it and gets it to work in the kernel. They're doing actually lazy allocation and free. So now, for this one, I don't know if he's actually doing it. You know, he's doing MMAP here. But he's not actually doing this with, um, with J.E. Malik. But he's saying here, you could actually do this correctly uh, and have it with, with shared memory. And it, it, you don't need to do, it's not going to do, uh, uh, it can do lazy allocation. So again, this is why I fucking love the internet, because I just post that shit out, and <laughs> some dude is in the Middle East and says, yeah, you're wrong, here's how to fix it, right? So that's awesome. All right, so they didn't do this because of this, because of this reason. So instead, what they're doing, though, is copy and shutdown. Basically, you have all local memory, when you, when, you know, as you malloc in your, in your process as you're running, then you get the shutdown command, then you just copy those pages into shared memory, uh, and then once that's done, then you write out a little file to disk and say, if you come back, here's where to go find the, the, the location of where I wrote the shared memory. Um, and then you boot back up and you, you can suck it all back in. So the, uh, again, this is essentially what I just said before. right? You get a restart command. You write out all your, your blocks to, to, to shared memory. And then when you come back, you check shared memory. And you see whether the, the actual physical contents of the database in shared memory matches with the new version of the software you just restarted to. Right? So if someone changed the, the layout of pages in the, in the new version, you'd come back and start you know, reading garbage or reading things that don't, don't look the way it should be looking to you. So they have a bunch of protection mechanisms to make sure that if my layout of memory changes for my database, I don't try to reload the, the, the old data. And if this all fails, you just go back and reload the data you already stored in disk anyway. Right? So like I said, this is a really interesting idea. 
uh, I'm actually interested in exploring how shared memory can be used for other things beyond just uh, this restart stuff, which I think is interesting. This is actually very similar to some of the arguments that the MongoDB guys made me, to me in the early days uh, about why they were using MMAP. And they would talk about how, like, oh, yeah, if the database crashes, which I guess you know, in the early versions of Mongo it did, uh, if you were using MMAP, you'd come back and all your, your database is still hanging out in the OS's page cache, so restarting is super fast. Right? So it's sort of the same idea here. Like, there's a way to decouple the, the contents of the database and memory from the actual lifetime of the process. All right, so to finish up, the, I focused on physical logging, uh, and we didn't get into the logical logging, but that's fine. And this is just because physical logging is used everywhere. It's what we use in our new system. It's what pretty much everyone uses except for, except for VoltDB and potentially FaunaDB, but I'm not sure. So if you're doing MVCC, the copy on update checkpoints is the way to go because you already have the versions. You already know what, what versions are visible to you, and you know how to use them to generate a, a consistent view of the database. So you just write those things out, out the disk. And then I talked a little bit at the beginning, and I won't say more about, I won't say more about this uh, for the rest of the semester, but non-volatile memory is coming. Uh, it's actually extremely interesting. I, as I said, my first PhD student did his entire dissertation on this. They actually turned it into a book last week. Um, but right now, I'm not interested anymore. I'm more interested in like the self-driving automated autonomous database stuff, which we'll talk, we're going to talk about that instead of non-volatile memory. So I think that's, that's more fun, okay? All right, any questions about recovery or checkpoints? Next class, we do networking protocols. Like, how do you, how do you, how do you actually have the client talk to the, uh, to the database system? What do those packets look like? And then we'll have the announcement for project two, and then I'll go through a list of a bunch of potential topics. I'm also gonna send out later tonight the, the, the link to uh, a Google spreadsheet where you, you form your groups. You don't have to pick a topic yet, uh, but you should you know, start talking about the things we'll talk about next class, what you want to do. I'm happy to meet with anybody too as well if you, if you want help brainstorming ideas. Okay? All right, guys. Uh, see you on Wednesday. Got a bounce to get the 40 ounce bottle. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't no puzzle, I guzzle because I'm more man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw my three in the freezer so I can kill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, oops, don't spill it. Cause ain't eyes, it's said, the pain I red. You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head. Take back the pack of duds. You go get you some same knives and drink it to the studs. Billy D is the silly cheese, sit down with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of St. Ives.